All right, so today we're going to talk about waves, in particular in section 15.1, we're going to be talking about types of waves. And so we want to identify what it is that waves are transferring, and we want to distinguish between mechanical and electromagnetic waves. We want to identify waves based upon their characteristic properties. Uh, particularly, we want to talk about transverse and uh, longitudinal waves and what properties those have. And then we'll explain how particles in a wave are able to move uh, and what it is that they move and how they move. And then we'll describe the differences between those transverse and longitudinal waves. So if we look at this leaf on the water, what we are going to see is an object that basically just moves up and down. If we pay attention to this vertical line, then we'll see the leaf is moving up and then moving down. And the wave itself is moving along this direction, right? So we might see the wave itself moving from left to right, but the leaf is moving up and down. Well, that's what's happening to all the little particles of water that are in there as well. If I had a little particle of water up there, and then if I looked at it later on, it'd be down here, right? So the particle of water is just moving up and down as well. Okay, and so here we have the idea about waves, that they're actually not moving the water forward, all right? We're gonna say no. Now, what we're gonna see here in a little bit is are things like surface waves, where the particle might move a little forward, but then it moves back again, right? So we wanna think about, is the particle generally moving forward in a forward direction? No, it's generally just moving up and down. And so how does that move? Uh, how does that particle move? Um, it's just going to be going up and down, or depending upon um, the type of uh, wave, you might have it be going, um, you know, back and forth as well. So like up and down or back and forth, you can kind of talk about um, its motion just being oscillating, right? It's just going to be in an oscillating motion where it's just going back and forth or up and down. So wave is defined as a perturbation or disturbance that transmits blank through matter or space. What is a wave actually doing? Okay, it is transmitting energy. Okay, so the wave transmits energy through matter or space. Uh, perturbation is just another word that basically means disturbance. And so we just got to think about it's some sort of a um, disturbance that is moving things through matter or space. So what can move through matter, what can move through space? Well, that's what we're dealing with here, mechanical waves versus electromagnetic waves. A mechanical wave is going to require a medium to move a particle, okay? So these things are oscillating. Um, and so again, these things are traveling, are transferring through a medium, or you can think about matter, right? It's transferring through matter. Um, and so you've gotta have some sort of matter um, that the energy is transferring through, okay? An example of this would be like a sound wave. If you have ever heard a sound in your life, <laughs> then you've heard a sound wave. And the only way you're able to hear them is through the air particles that are around your ears and that are around the uh, object that's making the sound. So sound waves are mechanical waves. They require mediums. Uh, they require material to move through in order for you to hear them. Um, other types of waves, for instance, like an ocean wave, right? An ocean wave um, is going to require a medium as well. So what are my mediums? Well, in the ocean wave, the medium is water. In the sound wave, the medium is air. Okay, so they require mediums. The electromagnetic waves do not require a medium, right? So there's no medium required for an electromagnetic wave. And the electric fields um, are going to be oscillating but there's also magnetic fields, right? So we have two different types of fields and we're gonna see a little picture of those here in a little bit. But those two different types of fields are actually kind of going um, in opposite directions of each other. It's a little hard for me to draw it. They're not exactly a good picture, but you're gonna see a better picture later. There is both an electric field and a magnetic field and an electromagnetic wave. And we typically think about light, um, but light has these two components, right? It has the, the, the light component and the magnetic components, electromagnetic. It's got two different components, electric fields, and magnetic fields are both moving um, in electromagnetic wave. These can actually travel through the vacuum of space. 
Okay, and you actually see this as an example. Maybe you're talking um, on the phone um, and your friend is right next to you and maybe you're talking to, uh, to them on their phone, right? Well, what's gonna happen is sometimes your voice is gonna travel to his phone, right? Um, and then that actually is going to travel uh, by radio wave to a radio tower, right? The cell tower. And that's gonna transmit the energy up to a satellite, you know, up in space. <laughs> There's our satellite up in space. And then it uh, takes that signal, transmits it back to the cell tower, and then that transmits it to your phone. And so by the time you hear it, it has gone all the way up to space and back. Okay, so um, electric ma electromagnetic waves are actually able to travel through the vacuum of space, even though, of course, um, it's traveling through uh, air as well. But it doesn't require the air, and it can travel despite the air's um, you know, presence there. Uh, obviously, electromagnetic waves are not going to be able to travel through uh, dense materials um, like lead and things like that, but they can travel right through glass. And so your cell phone is going to work inside a building as long as you've got the, you know, windows uh, where there's glass that can allow for light to transmit through, then it can allow for a radio signal to transfer through as well. So kind of cool uh, to think about electromagnetic waves. Now, we're going to take a little bit of time to um, look at some tsunamis. And you know these two links here are good links to just get a little bit of a, uh, a feel for the tsunami that occurred in 2011 in Japan. Um, there was a, that tsunami killed about 28,000 people. There's a, um, an even bigger tsunami uh, that occurred in 2004, uh, Christmas Eve of 2004. Actually, it was the day after Christmas, I think. Um, and that happened in Indonesia and happened throughout Thailand and that uh, Indian Ocean area there and killed over 100,000 people. Uh, tsunamis have had a big impact in my life. Uh, they just have kind of, you know, I had no idea back in 2004 when I heard first about this tsunami that was killing so many people. I uh, had no idea about tsunamis, really. I hadn't really studied them. And this was the time when video had first you know, become available for watching um, these tourists that had had their camcorders and they were uploading video to the Internet. It was kind of a new thing back then. And uh, I watched all these different videos and it just kind of really made a big impact on me thinking, and, and kind of focusing in on the devastation that occurred. Um, I had no idea what some of the warning signs would be of a tsunami. Um, you know, if I had been uh, on vacation in Thailand on that beach, you know, where somebody else <laughs> had been vacationing when the tsunami happened, I wouldn't have known any better, wouldn't have had any idea, and I would have been wiped out, and I'm sure, sure probably would have died like so many people did as well. Um, so I hope today, uh, after watching these videos, and maybe you want to explore some more videos on your own, you'll take a little bit um, of time and understand uh, tsunamis a little bit more. Maybe as scientists in the future, you guys can do something to help to mitigate some of the losses that occur due to tsunamis. Um, they are a giant natural disaster that is very, very hard to um, you know to deal with. But uh, maybe there are some things that you guys will be able to do as scientists to help mitigate those factors. So we're going to take a few minutes here and we're going to watch the videos. I, if you're at home, I would encourage you to go uh, watch these videos. You can watch some other ones. Maybe you want to watch some of the ones about uh, the 2004 Boxing Day uh, tsunami as well. And those would be uh, good ones to watch also. Um, but I'm going to pause the video to let the people here in class watch uh, and the people at home watch this and you can watch it on your own for a bit. Okay, so welcome back. So now we have seen those tsunami videos. Um, and, you know, again, the idea here is that after we watch those videos that we had a a good feeling for, you know, the impact that they have on human life. And uh, as scientists, our job is to try to, you know, um, understand the world, understand nature, uh, and then hopefully make the world a better place. And so hopefully maybe scientists, you know, that might be even uh, watching this, future scientists might be able to do something to, um, you know, mitigate some of the, uh, the dangers that are presented by tsunamis. Okay, so our visual concept here, um, with electromagnetic waves. I just want to kind of show you uh, that we've got these two different 
waves that are perpendicular to each other, right? So we've got the waves uh, that are moving this way um, and the waves that are moving this way, right? They're at 90 degree angles to each other. Remember we said that one of them is the electric and one of them is the magnetic, right? So a light wave is an electromagnetic wave and it's got these two components that are basically working together um, at 90 degree angles and uh, they're still oscillating, but you've got, uh, sorry, you've got both the electric and the magnetic um, components to it. Now let's talk about a wave front because a wave front is going to be considered consider to defined as the part on the wave where everything uh, is like all the energy is the same. So you can see where I've kind of put my uh, red little uh, marker there and over here, this would be the wave front okay, of that particular one, but you'd have another wave front there on that next wave, you'd have another wave front there. Basically the point where you have all um, the same energy um, that's going to be considered a wave front. So you'd have lots of different wave fronts that are coming uh, from a droplet that would hit the water like this. Now, which of these wave fronts would have the greatest amount of energy, which would have the greatest height, the greatest um, total energy? Let's look at that. Well, at the very middle, if you think about being next to a, a very loud speaker, all right, then it's got a lot of energy. It's like blasting your eardrums. But if you walk away 100 meters, then it doesn't seem like it's that loud. Well, that's the idea, right? If you get really close and you have the loudest volume, that's going to be the greatest amount of immediate energy um, next to your body is right there at the center. So the greatest amount of immediate energy is at the center, but the total amount of energy, you're going to see that energy kind of dissipate, right? And so that energy, although it starts high and then it moves out, you're going to have tons of energy on the outside. Now, we've talked about total energy before. We just talked about kinetic energy versus potential energy, right? Um, and we saw that those two were actually equal to each other, right? That the law of conservation of energy says these things aren't, are, aren't actually changing. So wouldn't we see basically the same thing with these two, that the amount of energy that you start with in the middle has got to be huge, right? And then it just dissipates as you go outside. So really our total energy should be the same. We're just slowly dissipating. And we're gonna talk about why that might happen, what's going on with the dissipation. Um, but basically um, it's just like seeing light from a far away away. There's not as much of an intensity of light striking your eye because it has to um, shine through a much, much greater amount of space right before it gets to you. Um, so let's look at simple harmonic motion and we're gonna compare that to dampened harmonic motion. All right, so if we look at this particular um, spring, it's a weight that's stuck on a spring and it's just nice and stable right here. Uh, at the level of this dotted line. But if I pull that down, I pull that weight down, I have now loaded it with elastic potential energy, all right? Now it's ready to bounce back. Why? Because the spring has got some elasticity, kind of like a rubber band, right? It's got some elasticity built into it. So now it wants to try to react and go back up. And when it goes back up, it's now motion. And so it's now got kinetic energy. If it gets to the very top of its um, you know, trajectory, then it's got an extra bit of gravitational potential energy stored into it. And then it's going to start dropping back down. And as it drops down, it's going to change its kinetic energy and turn it back into elastic potential energy. So down here, it's stored up its energy again. So this is simple harmonic motion. If you pull down on this weight, it would just bounce, boing, 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 and it would bounce like that for quite a while. How is that going to be different to dampened harmonic motion? Well, here's the cool thing. If you think about this, you connect one spring to the next, okay, with another spring or one weight to the next with another spring, something that's flexible. And you do that all along the edges here, right? Well, now as I pull this spring or this weight down, it is going to slightly pull this weight down and that one coming down slightly pulls this one down, et cetera, et cetera. And so because these things are connected to each other or bonded to each other, now they have an impact on each other. And so as I pull this one down, some of its energy gets dissipated and put into this one and so on and so forth. Now, because of that, if I pull on this thing and make it bounce up and down, it is actually not going to bounce up and down nearly as long as that one that's all by itself and isolated. So I've dampened the motion of harmonics, right? I've dampened the bouncing up and down and how long it's going to do that. But you know what? This also kind of describes how a wave works. 
because as I pull one down, it causes a, an effect on the other. And so you can imagine that this would kind of wave this way and then it would kind of re rebound and it would kind of just keep doing this back and forth, right? Well, that's kind of what well, water molecules would do, right? So a water molecule is right next to another water molecule, which is right next to another water molecule. And so as one of them gets pulled down, then the other one gets pulled down slightly because they're all bonded to each other with these hydrogen bonds. And so why is it that water kind of all sticks together and creates these waves? Well, because you've got um, these interconnected molecules that are um, giving you dampened harmonic motion. And of course, that's why the wave is also going to help to dissipate, dissipate a little bit over time. So let's look at um, the illustration here of um, some waves that we see. Um, and these are pretty cool. Um, it gives you a good view of the, um, longitudinal and the, um, transverse waves. Well, which I thought I had one to open, right? But we're going to try and just click on this link and show you because the window apparently is no longer open. Um, let's click on that link. All right, and now we're going to pull this guy over here so you can see this. Now, um, if you are watching, um, you can see in this longitudinal wave, you can see how the wave seems to be moving along the whole path. But if you just focus on a single particle, if you look at the little red dots here with the arrows next to them, you can see that the little particles are just moving back and forth. So even though we get the impression that particles are moving per distance, they're not. The particles are actually um, just moving back and forth, right? They oscillate and the wave is moving through. So the energy moves through, but the particles themselves only oscillate. And it's really neat to be able to see that. You can see at the bottom here that we've got compression, compression, rarefaction. The place where they're bunched up together is called the compression. And the place where they're spaced out is called the rarefaction. Now, this is what happens uh, on a primary wave in an earthquake. These are the first waves that travel through. We'll learn more about earthquakes later on. And then you have a transverse wave. In this case, if we had little red dots, the little red dots would just be going up and down. Okay, So even though the wave looks like it's moving uh, through, it's just the little dots are going up and down. And then we have these surface waves. Now, these are the waves uh, of water at the surface boundary between the liquid and then the air. And you can see that there's these giant circles that the actual particle is making. Okay, now underneath um, where it's not on the surface, you can see that there are some small little circles. But basically, again, those particles are just staying, for the most part, in the same spot. They're just doing little circles around. And now this is interesting because this is what the Raleigh waves look like. These are Raleigh surface waves. And so this is what's happening at the surface between the solid um, and, in this case, air. So you can see that now our particles are actually moving in a counterclockwise position instead of a clockwise uh, direction. And that's kind of interesting. But they're also, open, also moving in an ellipsoid fashion instead of a circular fashion. So solids behave a little bit differently than liquids. But these things are still moving. The particles of the solids are moving just like that particle of the liquid was, right? You just, uh, uh, it has a slightly different types of fluid motion, but it is actually moving kind of like a fluid when it gets, uh, like when you have an earthquake, for instance. So that's a really fun little thing to take a look at and see those particles moving. All right, so again, this is just kind of showing you uh, that same illustration that we've got these, um, if this bottle, you focus on the red dot in the bottle, it's basically just moving in a circular direction. That bottle is just bobbing up and down. Now, the last little thing we want to talk about is these transverse and longitudinal waves, just a little bit more. Remember, we want to have a little detail to how to tell the difference between them. Um, and again, the transverse waves are moving um, where you can see the particle going up and down, and then the longitudinal goes back and forth. The top of a transverse wave is the crest, okay, and the bottom is going to be the trough. And then here on a longitudinal wave, the part that's packed together is called compression, the part that's spread apart is called rarefaction. So if I were taking a rope and I put it up against a door and I started flinging that rope up and down, that would be a transverse wave where the particles would move up and down. But the longitudinal wave would see um, this little particle where this ribbon would be, for instance, that ribbon would be moving back and forth just a little bit as I took that spring and I popped it back. Uh, just think about a slinky that would be kind of laying on the ground. 
So transverse waves have particles that vibrate perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Okay, they're moving up and down. The direction of the wave is going left to right, then the particles are going up and down. And again, a great example of a transverse wave is light or electromagnetic waves. <clears throat> Sound is going to be a great example of a longitudinal wave. All right, so let's look at what we have learned today. Um, we've learned that waves transfer energy. We've learned that the difference between mechanical and electromagnetic waves has to do with whether or not they have a medium that they're traveling through. Mechanical has a medium, electromagnetic does not need a medium. We've learned a couple of the basic characteristic properties of waves, and uh, we've learned that um, the particles are moving uh, in an oscillating fashion, either up or down or left to right. Um, and depending upon whether you have a transverse or longitudinal wave, uh, they might be moving um, in the up and down version for transverse and the back and forth direction for longitudinal. Uh, all right, so I think that's covered it. I hope you guys have learned a lot today and enjoyed uh, learning about waves and wave motion, wave action.